All right, hello, hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Another episode of Wild Wisdom and Storytelling with Blaine, the Hurt Man, and Druzik. Hello, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody, that uh, watched the last episode. All your comments uh, were so much appreciated. And uh, yeah. I am honored to be here. Right on. Well, I figured today you wanted to take uh, the theme of the, the journey of the herbalist. So I want to hear a little bit about your story. And within that, you know, those that you have helped and inspired along the way, which are dozens, into the hundreds. And those uh, of us that are, you know, just embarking on the path. I have this belief, the saying that everybody can be a herbalist, right? It's the people's medicine. It's the folk Absolutely. medicine. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I didn't fully understand how it was destined in a way until I did that solo trip at 18. Right. And I didn't understand why, um, well, I was seeing all sorts of creatures and lots of birds. It was a bit like living in a teepee where there's no windows. So you learn to see with your ears. Right. And uh, every night I'd hear new sounds and then the next day I'd see the bird that went with the sound. So I got to know my bird calls a bit more. But there was a lot of owls around. And I could be sitting out in front of the cabin smoking my pipe and the owls, they must have 270 degree vision or something. (laughs) Because I'd be sitting there smoking my pipe and after the owl had already passed me, I would just lift the stem from my lips and the owl would circle around to see what that was. Right. You know, and I didn't quite understand what owl energy was all about and I didn't know anything about totems back then. But um, um, when I came out, the owls were saying, you've done, um, I I got all sidetracked for a couple of days with an old girlfriend uh, was pleading me for me to come out of the woods to be her escort for her grade 12 graduation. And I thought, I'm halfway to being gray owl here. I I can't just leave all the bugs and the beads and and the birds and the beaver and and go with a big crowd of people and dress up. I I just can't do that. Yeah. But um, um, the owls said, When I got back, the owls said, not with real words, of course, that I too had graduated Hmm. and that I'd made it through a lot. I had a lot of close calls on on that trip. I got between a bear and her cubs. Um, I almost drowned a couple of times. Um, You know, there, there were some pretty close calls. But the owls said, you too have graduated, but you could stay here forever and have a good life. You've proved yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh, But your mission, the reason you came back this time, was to never stop learning and to teach. That's right. why you're here. Wow. And, and it's a big part of, it became a commitment. And, that's why, and I love teaching, mm-hmm. you know. And a big part of it is that every time I teach a class, I'm always learning from some of you. I mean, at times I have professionals in a class, like nurses and physiotherapists and massage therapists and people that uh, I've always learned a lot of new tricks from the students because, you know, then everybody knows things that somebody else doesn't. So just learning things about humanity right. and, um, and etiquette and, and various things. So my students have helped shape me over the years. Thank all of you for shaping me because um, that's my whole mission is to never stop learning. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's been a bit hard on me being in the hospital and now a care home this long I'm, I'm just, I'm loving this so much to get back into a teaching mode because um, it's apparently what I'm supposed to be doing. For sure. Well, you it's know. a sign of a teacher. You, you never stop learning and a sign of the wise man knows how much he doesn't know. One of the uh, trips to California that I was on when I was being introduced, uh, the woman said, Blaine really knows what he's talking about. He knows all his chemistry, but he's also half stand-up comedian because... You know, when you're teaching things like botany and, and chemistry, they can be really dry. Yeah. But, I mean, botany especially can be even sexy, you know, because flowers right. are the plants having sex. So when you get it, you know, it's, uh, it should be a lot of fun is all I'm saying. Yeah, totally. And I think that has a lot to do with shaping my career as an instructor. Mm-hmm. And um, when I realized it's, it's frustrating sometimes to see... Well, when you're doing a class, say even something like Herb One that's going to go on for several weeks, you know within a few weeks, you can see the bright eyes in the room. 
Yeah. And you can you know that certain people here are going to follow this path and make this a career. Yeah. And there's other people that maybe should be at home walking, watching a hockey game or something. Right. But but at least people are going to learn enough to help their family or themselves. Yeah. And that's okay too. You don't have to be a practitioner. Yeah. But um, um, it, it gives me great pride to know that I've inspired so many people to go on and do bigger things. Like, um, if there's any reason I'm not going to be able to teach as much as I used to, it's because I created my own competition. Right. And and that that just warms my heart. You know yeah. that that there's so many people out there doing darn good work, and they might have just started in her one. You know. Yeah. So oh, that's amazing. Well, one thing that you really uh, inspired me with and I, I share this often, um, this idea of being your own herbalist, because, you know, I didn't choose the formal route. I've kind of, you know, pieced it together by, you know, hanging out with you on plant walks, reading books, you know, doing more kind of short courses, personal study versus the formal kind of certificate or diploma path in, in the goal of being a practitioner. Right. And uh, I remember you saying, he's like, you're like, Malcolm, think about that word, a practitioner. It's a herbal practice. Right, the idea. I mean, well, that's, even that's like all we're doing, right? Medical standard practice is, you know, human beings are so complicated that if you came with no relative background and went to medical school, eight years really isn't much of an education. Mm -hmm. So then you go out and start your practice. Yeah. So you start practicing on people, and you make mistakes. Mm -hmm. We're complicated. Yeah. And what worked for Betty Sue last week may not work for Jimmy Jimmy this week at all. You know, I, I sometimes have uh, somebody's complaining they can't sleep and I might, um, well, backing it up, um, anything I would use for myself or recommend to you, I would use on a dog. Right. But cats, when it comes to um, their nervous system, are wired backwards. Yes. So sometimes if I've given people that can't sleep my best sedatives, and they say, oh, I just couldn't sleep all night. I couldn't sleep for three days after that stuff. I go, oh, you're a cat. You know? <laughs> Gives a whole <laughs> other meaning to a cat lady, right? Um, so, um, uh, yeah, you just have to be really aware and really listen, really listen to people. And I think a big problem with standard practice medicine, like, frankly, I just saw my doctor, the, the new doctor I got. I, I have a, a family doctor of sorts that I've seen for years and, uh, she has saved me many times. Uh, Jeanette Soriano is her name. And um, I, I feel so privileged that because of all the work that I've done over the years, I have my own little team of practitioners, acupuncturists, and people like that, that if I do get in trouble, mm -hmm. that I can call in. But um, um, when I saw my doctor yesterday, it was for after about three months of waiting, uh, we had about five minutes together because mm -hmm. you know, they're busy. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, how are you doing? You're pretty good. Everything's fine. Okay, I got to go. You know. Yeah. Or um, like I was last visit, I was talking about cancer and how as um, soon as that word comes up, most people are instantly afraid. Right. It's a big deal. Yeah. Um, being told that you have cancer, and um, you you don't you need spiritual help as much as you need chemotherapy. Right. You know, you, you've got to kind of lighten up and realize that your own attitude, like for years, I, I slowly developed the belief that even thinking about cancer, talking about cancer causes cancer. Right. So when you let down your own, um, like it's incredible what you do with a smile, never mind a kiss or a hug. Mm -hmm. But uh, I remember one fellow coming to see me, I think it was SARS when it broke out. And he was all nervous and came to see me. Somebody re referred him to me. And uh, he was like, oh, you know, next week I, I have to go to Toronto. Where I'm going to be in the, in the hotel right across the street from the hospital, the, the, the epicenter of the whole thing. I know I'm going to get this, this, this virus. And I, I just said, well, with that attitude, I believe you. Because you know, <laughs> yeah. you've already convinced yourself that right. you are. And I said, I've got some antiviral things here. But the first thing we have to do is find something that makes you happy. Right. When you walk through a storm, hold your head up high and don't be afraid of the dark. Like that's, that's real. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so we have to keep people's spirits up mm -hmm. too, you know. Yeah. It's, sometimes it's not as literal, but um, 
it's a big part of your immune system that all your pheromones are in place. And, right. Uh, so that's a big part of why things like flower essences work, is that we were all born with an innate ability to heal ourselves, but sometimes we get off track. Right. Um, too busy, stress, things mm -hmm. like that, and, and you, you, you get off that path, and I mean, that's what happened to me, really. Yeah. I was too busy trying to help everybody else and wasn't taking care of myself anymore and was not listening to the... I was getting clues and some strong ones, but I wasn't listening Yeah. because I was too busy. Yeah, actually. And it took me down. It kind of yeah. reminds me of a theme of our last conversation, uh, which is relating to this one. So the first part is, you know, the, the teacher is always the student, you know, demonstrating that. Like that's one how it becomes a good, good teacher and, and remains one and builds wisdom is always being open to learning. Yeah. And uh, another theme, it was <clears throat> introduced to me by Stephen Herod Buner, another uh, great herbalist. And uh, he says, you know, every great healer, every great herbalist, you know, there's, there's something almost like that initiation that you went through as a young man, right, where you graduated. He was speaking from a perspective of, in his elder years, that he needed to become the patient, you know, and allow the wisdom and healing of others to help him, right. having spent yeah. so much of his life helping other people. Is that and the, the, the clues are there, like a lot of the the old Greek legends and things like that, where that's part of what flower essences are based on, is the plant gives you clues. Right. Just look look at me. What <laughs> what do you see? You know, and and that's what I'm good for. Right. So um, it was interesting when um, uh, my former wife started teaching flower essences and needed slides to show, uh, we went through I might have had 20 shots of a plant and three of them I would have thrown out because they were a bit out of focus or blurry or something. And that's the one she picked because the little blurry one is what the flower essence was good for. Right. You know, if, when people were a little wonky, right. that's the one she picked was the one I was going to throw out. Yeah. So there's so many ways of looking at things, but um, we get lost. We're so busy in today's society and sitting with a tree and just... You don't have to be a crazy person to just sit there and breathe deep and allow, allow the plants to talk to you in a way. Mm -hmm. And for people who, I mean, I have no hesitation to admit I'm a tree hugger. Yeah. I, I've felt lots of it, but some people think that, oh, you're one of those people that spikes trees so that people get hurt by with their chainsaws blow up because they hit spikes and, you know, all that sort of thing. Well, that's... That's bad karma right there. But um, um, hugging trees, and I always like to say for people that, are, that are, have never done that before, hugging a little bush or just holding a flower that's still alive in your hand, um, uh, one of the flowers, big flowers, are really nice when they open them. And, and you get this... When you're first introduced, they've just never done this before. Uh, you, you, you hold your hand back a ways and bring it close to a really big flower, like an amaryllis or something, when it's just open the first day. And whoa, you pick up this energy way back here. Yeah. And as you come closer to the flower, it's just, you know, and they've just never tried that before. Cool. You know, even yeah. like, I remember one, you just kind of, th there's so much, we think about chakras, and everybody talks about nine or ten. Those are the big ones. But yeah. there's, there's a chakra between every joint in mm -hmm. your body. So hands and feet. Right. That's why walking barefoot is, is such a cool thing. Yeah. But your hands and your feet are, are like rip rapids in a river. There's so many eddies there. So if you just kind of energize your hands and hold them out, and as you start bringing them together, you start realizing there's an energy there that starts to feel like you're holding a beach ball. And, and you, you try and, and it's like squeezing a beach ball. It gets harder and harder. Yeah. And then all of a sudden the polarity flips and your hands suck together. Right. And with practicing that a little bit, you can scan yourself first, I suppose, but start scanning the dog right. or, or whatever. And you know, I, I remember one man who enlightened me a lot to that sort of energy work. Um, 
oh, and I'm, I'm always so sad when there's somebody who was born to be a healer and they're hanging drywall for a living or driving a cab or something. Right. You, know, you should be practicing. Um, but uh, especially people that have come from other countries yeah. and they're, they're just trying to get a job, they need a cash flow. Um, I remember one, one fellow who was a medical doctor in another country and he's taken her one. Like I should have been touch, leaning, learning from him, not should have been the other way around. Mm -hmm. But he was like, and what do I need to be a, a you know, herb, herbalist in this country? And I said, for you, some business cards. Right. <laughs> you know, for you know, sure. Um, and um, so we all learn and keep learning from different, like I said, different met modalities and from other people and from other countries. And um, some of the things I've learned, just little tricks from Cindy Wu about um, a few of the acupuncture points. I have no, I don't have time to learn to be an acupuncturist, but I respect, I respect it. Just like um, I find astrology very interesting and some people think it's a joke. But yeah. I go, look, go spend a few days at the ocean and uh, you're going out for dinner and you're leaving your boat in the evening and uh, the pylons uh, on the dock are like this high. And when you come back at midnight or whatever, they're 12 feet in the air. Right. So um, a gazillion dollars worth of boats and a whole bunch of starfish and, and other things got sucked up and down 12 feet there. You, you don't think the moon has some influence on us? <laughs> you think that's just, and it happens every day and it's calendared and you, yeah. know, you can track it. So I'm not an astronomer, astrologist, but I certainly accept that it works. For sure. You know? And it's fascinating to so, listen to those that um, really know it. There's a few people, uh, some of my oldest and dearest friends, that they, they have a little scrapbook of all their charts that they've done with their friends and family. Mm -hmm. And if any one of them phoned me and said, Blaine, are you going somewhere? Are you going on a trip in the next couple of days? Don't go. Because they just picked something up in my chart. Right. And I, I'd cancel the plane flight. Plane flight yeah. Um, like I said, it'd be a Blaine flight too, flight too but um, <laughs> cancel the Blaine flight, that's it. Um, because I trust in it, and then I read in the paper the plane crashed or something. Right. Or got hijacked, or, you know, and, and there's all these mysterious things that we don't have to fully understand yeah. to just accept them. For sure. You know? Yeah. So I want to pull on a couple of threads there. You know, even that leads into this idea of of just awareness. So we have the story about the, the young man that you had mentioned next to the hospital with, with that attitude, you are going to catch it, right? And how much that deep-seated uh, emotional state, mental state um, can help us, you know, attract health or, or not. And then this other idea that you mentioned when you were out as a young man, that just being in nature and having that awareness and bringing those two together of where I'm going with this is kind of part of the path with the herbalist is, is to observe and to be around the plants and develop that relationship and have those interactions. And something that people would really relate to is uh, relating to animals like dogs, right? Being around a dog is just automatically. I hate it when somebody, uh, somebody thinks you have to yell at a dog to train it. Right. Like their hearing is so much better than ours. <laughs> yeah. You know? and some of the dogs I've had, it, it, it was successful to, you, you know, you just train them and, psst, hey, what, what are you doing? Yeah. And eventually you end up with a dog that they'll stop what they're doing just by, you know, psst, and you just raise your eyebrows and they quit what they're doing. Right. You know, you don't have to yell at them. No. You get these people, the dog runs off and they, hey, 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 and then, like the dog, it's, they may as well be on a megaphone. You know? Right. Yeah, it's about relating to another species. You know, we're so used to kind of human to human interactions. And then that next level down, many people like yourself have more experience relating to animals. And specifically when you're in a good relationship with an animal, like blood pressure goes down, you know, mood goes up. And then that next level is building relationship to plants. And like you said, you know, hugging a tree or being in the presence of a flower. And I think it's that combined with the awareness and everything that comes from that relationship, it can elevate your mood as well as your knowledge, your wisdom about the plants, deepening yep. your relationship and your ability so to work with them. Things like hugging trees now has science behind it. Right? And I always like to say, well, you know, it's, for me, it's still a little bush. It's like hugging a child and holding on to a young tree 
is like hugging a teenager. Right. But when you can wrap your arms around an old oak. Mm -hmm. that's or, like, or not, right? Because it's or so not. big. Yeah, that's, that's like hugging grandpa. Right. And there's that wisdom. Yeah. But I, I found it so interesting in some of the reading I've been doing that uh, the evidence is there now. The science is there to support that the trees like it too. Mm -hmm. Like the tree might be having a boring day or be a little sad. And if you're all frizzed out with stress and you come in and hold them, you're actually doing a treatment for the tree because right. it makes them giggle. Yeah. You, they're getting all this energy <laughs> from you. So it's a mutual exchange hugging a tree. Yeah. And all the pheromones they can track, uh, it, the science is there now. For sure. It's, it's good for both of you. Yeah. Yeah. For so be a tree hugger. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's kind of pull this back. I, I want to hear a little bit more about uh, your journey into the wilderness. You know, like a, as a teenager, what what kind of drew you that way? Well, I I spent a lot of summers. Um, my family couldn't afford a, a big cabin kind of thing, but um, I spent a lot of my summers growing up at Waskasu Lake, which is in the Prince Albert National Park, and um, that's where Gray Owl spent a lot of his time. Um, so I mentioned Gray Owl earlier, a lot of people know him, a lot of people don't, but um, he had been a trapper. He came from England at a very young age, about the same as me. He was about 18, I think, when he came and went living in the woods. He was with the uh, Ojibwe, I think, uh, and became a trapper. He was a beaver trapper Great. and hunter, and, and um, uh, one day uh, him and his, he had, he had gotten a, a native uh, bride, Anna Hario, and um, one day they found uh, a couple of beaver kittens that had lost their mother, probably to a trapper. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were just so cute and cuddly, it's like somebody picking up a kitten, mm -hmm. that they decided to adopt them. And so they ended up living with the beaver. Wow. And uh, this got to the point where uh, he became one of Canada's first conservationists, really. He was, he was touring Europe, every country, uh, doing addresses uh, even even our own queen right. kind of thing, uh, trying to convince people that these beautiful animals um, shouldn't be killed just to make fashionable hats anymore. Like give it up, make hats out of something else. Right. So um, when they moved him to Saskatchewan, that he became rather employed by the National Park Service, and uh, they took him to a place not far from Waskasu, uh, where there was a lake called Ajawan, where you can't get a big boat in or you can't, uh, you got to pretty much hike or you can canoe in. Um, and uh, they let the beaver go and um, they built their own house. They let the beaver pick a spot to build their own house, a beaver lodge. And then they built a log cabin for Gray Owl and his wife on top of the beaver lodge wow. and cut a hole uh, in the kitchen floor. So the beaver could, or the sort of a hole in the roof of the beaver lodge. Right. So the beaver could swim into their lodge as usual and be sitting with them at the dinner table. Wow. And um, <laughs> uh, so he was a big influence on me, I suppose, just reading about his stories. But growing up at, in a national park, animals tend to be more tame. Mm. But uh, I was very young when I had um, very close encounters with coyotes and bobcats and... and um, a, bee, or a, uh, a, a mink once, very oh, close, yeah. and uh, I, I was just telling you in the drive over, my uh, these little cabins that we, we didn't have a big fancy cabin, but we had these, um, there was a whole neighborhood of what were called shack tents, where the, they had a wooden floor and wooden walls, but a canvas roof, roof and there was running water was a, a short ways away, and there was only a couple of washrooms per block, so it was a very dark night. And uh, I have an older brother and sister, and I had to go to the, the bathroom. And uh, they were really, really, really teasing me that you, you be careful, you're going to get eaten by a bear, sort of thing. They had me all worked up, so I was running as fast as I could to get to the to the toilet. And it was such a dark night, I t-boned a black bear, like I ran full speed right into a black bear and did a whole uh, somersault, yeah. and ended up flat on my back with this bear looking down at me, and I could just barely make out the shape to know that the head was at that end and it was looking down at me. And I, I probably didn't need the washroom after that. I probably peed my pants, you know? <laughs> yeah. But um, um, looking back, I think the bear probably sniffed me and thought, what a stupid kid, you know? <laughs> and just very slowly walked away. Yeah. You know? So I guess that was my first bear encounter. Wow. But um, 
uh, and there's been many since, but um, um, growing up from that environment, I think I was 11 years old when I had my, not proud of this anymore, that I had my own little trap line, mm -hmm. just small game, and we would get uh, um, never anything as valuable as a mink, but weasels and flying squirrels and things, and um, you, you have to put the hides on a stretcher and you would bring the, the pelts in, somebody else is going to tan them. But, um, so I had my own account at the Hudson Bay Trading Post where I would get things like snowshoe bindings and, really? and ammunition for my 22 and uh, a knife, new knife maybe. Yeah. And uh, uh, most often I was spending cash more than I was making as a trapper. But um, uh, just growing up spending a lot of time from an early age in the woods mm -hmm. and uh, by the time I was a teenager, um, you just get more and more into it, more confident, and pretty soon summer camping gets, you get better clothing and sleeping bags and stuff, so you can, pretty soon you're three season camping, you go a lot later in the fall and you're out earlier in the spring, because yeah. you're anxious to get camping. And um, I, it never occurred to me to, to be a herbalist kind of thing, right. but slowly I learned a few things about the plants. And after my big trip there, it was 1974, I think, when I was just 18, um, I had learned enough to make me want to learn more, right? Because I thought I'm going to be—I want to go to places where I think, as I mentioned the other day, first aid by definition is what to do until help comes, right? But I wanted second aid just to be more independent, right? You know, what if you're 250 miles from the nearest road and smash your kayak on a big rock and you're stuck there with a hurting leg and right? Um, our native people, our indigenous people, lived in the wilderness, yeah. and they had they had learned things to do. Like when uh, round-eyed white people came uh, with the fur trade and all that, and maybe they've um, uh, somebody has well one of the guides slipped on a mossy rock and he's hurt his ankle, and he's sitting over there peeling strips of bark off a red willow and chewing them and wrapping them around his ankle. And the white guys are going, well, what is this guy doing beaver impressions now or what's going on here? You know, <laughs> there was no Ed Sullivan show yet. You know, why is he doing this? Uh, but they slowly realized, like later in the day at the end of the paddle, it was a long day, and he's crushing up and chewing th that bark again and rubbing his shoulder with it. Yeah. But through the course of the trip, as other people had these problems, they thought, why not try it? Mm -hmm. And then the news spread, and that's how we ended up with aspirin. Right. You know, if it started with, like, the genus of willows is Salix. Right. And there's an acid in there that's cyclic in shape. So um, when you take Salix and cyclic and you make the synthetic form, it's acetyl salicylic cyclic right. acid. And... Uh, so thank you, Dr. Beyer, for bringing it to the world in little white pills so you don't have to chew bark anymore. Right. But um, it turns out that in the boreal, I didn't learn until uh, getting to France. I, I haven't traveled a lot in the world, but um, a short trip to France, um, visiting distilleries and museums and things like that. It was kind of our honeymoon with my second wife. And as um, um, soon as we got there and I walked in the forest, I was just astonished that apart from there's oak trees and olive trees, which don't grow here because of the cold winters, uh, I could go to Provence next week and do a, a herb walk. Right. It's exactly like Kananaskis country yeah. because the uh, latitude and whatnot uh, in the foothills is the same as Kananaskis country. Right. So um, um, a lot of this stuff is you can combine uh, even, of course, we, we're learning now that it's almost like the last frontier, all of the medicinal mushrooms. Right. And, and a lot of them grow here, too, mm -hmm. not because we're planting them, but they grow. Um, I remember having a discussion with Terry one day, and he wouldn't believe me that uh, one of them, uh, it, it only grows on the silk, uh, this, um, the larva of the silkworm. Uh, well, that's what they call it, was the silkworm mushroom. Right. And, and I said, no, 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 that grows in Saskatchewan, too. And I had pictures to show him that in sphagnum moss that's about this deep, yeah. uh, way down here is the larva, and, and they're growing way up here, and there's the little paddles. 
uh, th that they're still doing the same thing on some other larva, they grow here too because right. it's similar habitat, right? Yeah. So um, I it just it was, I think it was just time in the saddle. Yeah. And uh, slowly getting more confidence. Uh, it went from using a slingshot as a kid to a pellet gun and then a 22 and um, having a couple of neighborhood boys that took me out and taught me a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mentioned this in the book that um, we were out one day in the winter where a big open space where the, the snow was crusted from the wind and it was about this thick but with a pack on uh, the crust suddenly broke and I fell into about seven feet of snow right. and you're in all this crystallized snow and your snowshoes might even still be on which is a big problem because you're upside down choking in the snow right but um, your feet are still on top yeah you know, doing what they should you know that so you've got to have strong enough abs to 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 get sent sort of up to get your pack off to get up to the snowshoes to get the bindings off to get them under you again right you know and then start working on it but my friends with me refused to help me <laughs> okay these, these two gurus of mine refused to, no no we're not helping you because next time this happens you might be alone so you have to figure it out so they eventually came around and gave me some clues but um, um, yeah just time in the saddle yeah and wanting to learn more and um, when I got back from that trip I ended up in Calgary and that's when Terry had just started her college Wild Rose and uh, I was in like Flint, as they say, and um, he pushed me into teaching because he could see I was capable. Yeah. And one step at a time, it just grew from there. Yeah. So it, it ended up being a full-time career that changed my life, and I've helped a lot of people along the way. Yeah. And it was something I wasn't looking to do. You know, I kind of came in the back door, you might say. Right. And... Um, um, I certainly accept a lot more indigenous beliefs now and understand totems a lot more. We can have plant totems and animal totems and just because you saw a seagull the other day doesn't mean it's your totem. <laughs> you have to have a meaningful experience. Right. And, uh, and it goes from there, right? Yeah. So um, in spending a lot of time in the dog park again, um, there's a dog that appears to be vicious and a lot of people are afraid or whatever and that's just going to trigger the other people are two dogs are fighting and everybody's yelling at them that just makes them more aggressive mm -hmm. and several times I've just sat down as close as I dared to two dogs fighting just sat down on the ground and put my hands out and went hey and they've actually ta stopped and turned their heads because right. why isn't this guy yelling like everybody else and and I just hold my hands out, and within a moment, they're coming up and licking my hands. Yeah. End of dog fight. I, I don't claim to be a dog whisperer. It's just changing the energy. Right. You know, because everybody else was being aggressive as well as the dogs. You know? <laughs> right. You know, so, yeah, I don't know. It's, um, there's been a few occasions where something was happening, and somebody in the audience or the group said, Blaine, do some Reiki on her. I said, I, I don't do Reiki. I've never studied Reiki. And one woman yelled, you do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember somebody had a really bad headache. And I just put my hand on top of her head for about a minute and just focused and asked for help. And um, she opened her eyes within a minute and just went, damn, you're good. Right. And it surprised me because I didn't know what I was doing, but I was just opening up to a better energy yeah you know? again it comes back to that that awareness and practicing like you said yeah just feeling yeah having the intention directing well you can back to the fellow who turned me on to that he was it ended up getting him in trouble because he was working as a massage therapist and his job was just to loosen people's muscles up before they saw the cat chiropractor and um, he'd be working on uh, some woman's lower back and and sort of go, excuse me, missus, you have, um, you know, gynecological type person in your life. Could you, I think you should go see something wrong with left ovary. And sure enough, she had a tumor growing there. Right. And if he hadn't brought that up, uh, it would have spun out of control. Mm -hmm. Another one was a retired medical doctor. And he was like, uh, doctor, you still have some friends, you know, uh, working uh, that way. I, I think uh, right lung something going on there. And again, the guy had a tumor. and. Right. And he had it 
dealt with, um, but he, he might have never gone in, could have died of it. You know? Yeah. So, and what was he doing? Hanging drywall, you know, where he should have been working as a healer. He was excellent. You get these people that do that because somebody three doors down turned all their lights on at once. Right. Like they feel energy, yeah. you know, or, <clears throat> or they know that they just wake up knowing something's inherently wrong and turn the TV on and there was a, uh, an earthquake and a major tsunami hit a village somewhere in Asia because mm -hmm. they're, they're that sensitive right. that they pick up those energy fields, you know, and I'm in awe of people like that. Yeah. But I guess just from, again, back to learning from my students, just from meeting people like that, I've picked up a bit of that energy. Right. To do it myself, just a little bit. You yeah. know, I'm not going to hang a shingle. No, for sure. But you know? it first makes you aware it's possible, you know, and then open to. It that. doesn't hurt to try with yeah. permission. You know, hey, would you mind me trying something? Oh, wow. Again, nice full in breath first. and Yeah. So, what would you say as uh, a recommendation, like? for someone like that who, who has these gifts or has these aptitudes towards plants and making steps towards bringing it more fully into their life, even, even as a career. Talk as much as you can. Right. You don't get advertising. Such, even if you've gone to school and you're already certified, getting a little advertisement in a magazine it's probably not going to get you too many new clients. Mm -hmm. People have to meet you and pick up your energy. Yeah. So I've told a lot of people, just go ride the sea train a lot with some business cards and just get talking to people. Right. And um, they, they might think you're a total flake, but some of them will realize there's, you connect somehow on an energy level and they're going to come and see you. Yeah. No, I love that. You know? And I would even say sea train, in the park, you know, be at the dog park or, yeah. you know, Denis and I were out doing videos yesterday and uh, there was this lady walking along and, you know, we were just kind of right crossing each other's paths and we started talking, we're like, yeah, we're, we're picking wild asparagus, you know, and that led one thing to the next and it's those kinds of conversations, right? There's a lot of wild asparagus in this town. There is. Along the Bow River, for sure, and um, I, I didn't know um, for quite a while that if you don't pick asparagus buds, kind of the, the babies, yeah. it turns into a plant about this high yeah, with very fern. poisonous red berries. Yeah. So if I'm walking the dog um, and it's fall and I see the mature plants, right. I'm looking around and anchoring. If I have some flagging, yeah. I might even flag it if I have some in my, in my fanny pack. Yeah. But uh, I'm just taking a close look because Oh, there's several of them down there. Yeah. And uh, I'll just anchor, kind of like hitting, uh, what's the button on the GPS? Uh, right, pinning uh, it. For um, if somebody falls out of the boat or whatever. Right. Uh, it, but I don't know what that button's called. It's like the fall out of the boat button or something. <laughs> um, uh, but just Found taking, an asparagus patch button. taking a good look at where there's the, the cross over the, the road there. And oh, I'm going to try and triangulate here. So I got that lamp post, mm -hmm. and you might be lucky enough to have something closer, like a fire hydrant or something, and triangulate so that you can kind of come back and find that spot the next spring. Totally. Right? Yeah, because you can't always, one of the things I rely on is the plants of last year, right? That fern-like yep. growth with the little red berries on it. That's your clue, your indicator. Uh, but it's not always there sometimes. And, and it's good to... Something I learned a long time ago, it might have been from Terry, um, sort of a first step in the door, etiquette-wise, is we call it the 1 in 20 rule. Right. If there isn't at least 20 plants, don't pick one. Don't mm -hmm. you dare pick one. Yeah. And if there's a lot of them, don't pick more than 1 in 20. Yeah. So you're kind of harvesting a little bit, but you're not decimating the crop. Because after all, when you pick asparagus, well, the root's still there. Yeah. When you pick asparagus buds, but... Um, there's some things like if you, if you go picking lady slipper, for example, it's the root that we use medicinally. Right. So you harvested the whole plant. Yeah. Well, they're not going to come back now because you ate it yeah. while you drank it or you make tea out of it. But um, 
Yeah, and asparagus yeah. is a little bit different in the sense that you pick it, it's going to force another spear up. Yeah. But if you do that, you don't allow any of them to come up. And uh, obviously, picking in an urban environment is, as well is a little bit different when there's there's such a concentration of population. Yeah. Can we all go and pick asparagus, you know, in the city? That's, that's well, back to uh, wood lily being one of my favorite vegetables. Yeah. If I was walking out in a national park, for example, or Kananaskis country, where it's illegal to pick things anyway, um, if I saw a wood lily, one wood lily right beside the path, um, I'm not going to eat it. And if I saw somebody else doing that, I would kick them as hard as I could off the trail. Mm -hmm. But it's when you're off a trail a ways and find a whole hillside cover, right. that's when you graze a bit and make a salad. You yeah. Know? Well, you've got that, uh, I remember you telling that story about the wood lilies and the lawyers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did I cover that last week? No, this I'm remembering oh, from yeah. way back. So I, I get, um, it confused me at first that I got hired by the Saskatchewan Bar Association to be a speaker at their national conference, or their annual conference, I'm sorry, provincial conference. And uh, I didn't understand at first why all these lawyers would want me, want me to do a talk there until I realized that a lot of the judges have um, cabins on islands that are out far in the lake and you might bust your boat and somewhere and be stuck in the bush for a week. That's yeah. why they wanted to know what I knew. And um, so I had, um, most often I try and, if I'm doing a walk somewhere I've never been before, I try and get in a day early to go for a little hike and scout what's around because I might take you for a 10 kilometer circle and all we see is the same six plants again where if we'd have just gone that way a couple of blocks, there was 50 species, you know? Yeah. So I, I try and scout the neighborhood, so to speak. Um, and I knew that around the next bend in the trail, there was a whole hillside covered with wood lilies. And I'm with Supreme Court judges here. Yeah. And, uh, and I, so I stop everybody and I say, now, I, I might have a little problem when we come around this next bend in the trail because my favorite vegetable is growing there, but it's, it's protected by law. And I might need a few of you to hold me back. So we, we come around the trail, and I, and I picked one and got pollen on my nose. I just, you, you pick, if you just pick the flower, you're not hurting the plant at all because the root's there and all that. And, and you just take the whole flower in your mouth and crunch it up. It's just, it's so good. And I was smiling, and one of the Supreme Court judges, um, he, he looked at his watch because it, it was getting close to lunchtime. And uh, he said, well, Henry, I, I, I don't think there's anything in the legislation about grazing. Right. <laughs> so I had, I wish I had a video of this. I had all these people uh, on their knees on the ground with their hands up in the air. It was like they were doing a new Macarena dance or something. Yeah. Everybody, see, we're not picking them. So you've got your fingers are up here. Everybody's got their fingers wiggling up here and they're on their knees and just eating them like, like an ungulate would, like an elk would, whatever with their fingers twinkling, and that was just so funny. Yeah. And we yeah. all laughed, and I'm sure the wood lilies were back next year, you know? Yeah, amazing. So, uh, yeah, and even the laughter was healthy, of course. <laughs> yeah. Fun. Well, speaking of, uh, you know, seeing plants in one area and in an, another ecosystem, you were sharing a story with me uh, last week about seeing Saskatoons. Was that in France? Yeah, and they had no idea they were edible. Right. We were staying at this hostel, at the, they called it a geet there, and uh, the, the road in off the, the main road, um, there were Saskatoons so heavy in the branches, they were hanging over, probably dragging on your roof rack kind of thing, and, and I asked the, the owner, the wife of the husband-wife team that ran the place, uh, if they do much with the Saskatoons, because they were really ripe right now, and she said, like, the what? And they don't know the word Saskatoon, right? I mean, yeah. that word comes from in several Aboriginal sort of indigenous uh, languages. There's different names like Saskawatatchikdak or something. And uh, so it's close to Saskatoon. And it's in the middle of the prairies where several tribes that would otherwise fight each other got together like Woodstock for three days of peace, love, and music. Mm -hmm. And they do the sun dance and various rituals there. And um, um, that's where the name Saskatoon came from. So we call them Saskatoon bears because there's lots that grow along there, especially the river valleys. And uh, so uh, I, I, I was delighted that they only know the name of the plant by its Latin name. 
Right. And I told her where I was talking about, and she said, "Oh, I'm a lanchier. Uh, oui. Uh, you, you you don't eat those? Oh, you could, you could do that, you know, kind of thing." So, my first day in a new country, and I'm making Saskatoon berry pies <laughs> for everybody staying in the hostel. Yeah. And they just thought it was hilarious, right? Right. Or later that day, I found uh, it's one of the. They're called giant puffballs. Oh, like yeah. they're literally the size of, uh, bigger than a basketball. Yeah. And um, what I've done on the rare occasion I found them is uh, whip up some um, eggs just to get a little batter going and um, dip them in an egg and then dust them with something like cornmeal maybe mm -hmm. and fry them and, and you got like a plate sized yeah. slice and they're, they're just great with a little batter on them. You know? Oh, amazing. And uh, they didn't know about eating those either. No. <laughs> so um, uh, probably everybody staying there that we got a taste of those that night. Nice. Is there anything else like this that's poisonous? No. No. Nothing looks like a puffball. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't eat them when they're prime, they just go hollow, and you squeeze them, and that's where all the spores come out. And yeah, which my understanding you can actually use uh, for first aid. That spore. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's astringent. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. For like. Yeah, thanks second. for reminding me. Yeah. And you have a story about, uh, you know, I'm sure you have many actually, in terms of, you know, using herbs in a first aid situation. Did you not like impale your foot on a, on a branch or a twig one time? Oh, I've got several stories about that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. There were, um, weren't any puffballs around, but there was, there was something else, I'm sure. That you used. Well, one of the one of the worst examples for me doing that was um, um, for quite a few years I was renting a house in Mount Royal. It was about an acre yard, so I had to teepee up in the side yard, and mm -hmm. the yard wasn't fenced. So my borzoi, a Russian wolfhound, at the time needed to be chained. So I had her chained such that she could get in out of the rain into the teepee, but not far enough to lay on the bed all wet, and. Um, so I had, as the grass wore out in front of the door, well, one time camping, I just uh, used the chainsaw to cut a bunch of slices, probably of a poplar tree, and drilled a hole in the middle of them and used some 10 inch spikes to just hold them all in place. Mm -hmm. And once in a while the dog's chain would get wrapped around one and it would flip upside down and I'd have to go put it back and I would stomp on it to put the, the nail back. Right. And uh, I think it was after a birthday party where I was probably into the tequila a little bit or whatever, and uh, uh, got up in the middle of the night, probably for a pee, and one of them had flipped around, but I didn't realize it had flipped all the way around. So I stomped on it, um, oh. just like in bare feet, and this 10-inch this spike went right through my foot and was sticking out. Yikes. And uh, so I was into the house, and the first thing I would have done would have been to take a whole teaspoon of cayenne pepper um, orally with just a little bit of warm water down and uh, it was comfrey which I had growing in the yard I'd moved some in and I took, put some comfrey extract on it mm -hmm. and uh, wrapped it up in duct tape because it was like five in the morning and I thought okay I just got to get back to bed I just want to make sure I don't bleed to death so I right. taped it up and I woke up and it was raining and I thought you know I really should get this checked out I might have broken a couple of tarsals carpals, tarsals and uh, so I went to the ER and I, I, it was so painful when I went to get up for my first step. Uh, it was so painful that I fell face first right into the fire pit. So I had ashes all over me. Wow. And then um, I, I needed a cane, which I didn't have, so I used my camera tripod. So I showed up at the ER limping in with a camera tripod, ashes all over me, <laughs> probably reeking of tequila. Right. You know? And, uh, but the wound was perfectly clean. Right. And the, um, uh, the doctor, whoever was in charge at that moment, uh, was on the phone already. And I said, what are you doing? He said, well, we have to call in all GSWs. And I said, I just, uh, you think this is a gunshot wound? And he said, well, it has to be because it's cauterized. Uh, I don't know if this was, maybe you shot yourself in the foot or something, but we have to phone this in to the police. I said, it's not a gunshot wound. I, I, I told him again, I slammed my foot into a spike and I, I, I took cayenne pepper and, um, and, it's, and one of them actually made a cross and was backing away from me, you know, right. thinking I was some sort of witch or crazy or whatever. And uh, so I finally convinced them that no, 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 this is what I did and they didn't have to call the police and didn't. They 
they heard me out. And um, yeah, but, uh, or I could have used a tea bag. Right. We were talking about that the other day. Yeah. But, um, um, so there's herbs that, like Arnica, um, is so brilliant for um, preventing bruises. But if you've, if you've fallen and you really smashed your chest or a foot or something, you can't get Arnica tincture straight into the bloodstream. Right. So I, I might uh, um, comfrey the wound first, get the bleeding under control, and then very carefully put Arnica no closer than an inch to the hole. Right. So it, it's still going to handle the bruising around. It, you know, there's things like that that we have to respect. And uh, when I was studying, we didn't know why. We just knew you couldn't use Arnica internally. Right. And I think they know why now. It's there've been enough studies. There's some particular acid that's not good to take. And well, homeopath homeopathic is okay. Yeah. But um, um, as more and more stories are told, uh, some of them. I might have mentioned the other day that every large pharmaceutical company has scouts all over the world looking for new, like a lot of our antibiotics are failing, so mm -hmm. they're looking in the rainforest for new herbs yeah. that they can use as antibiotics, but they'll, again, they're going to be analyzing them and looking to make them synthetically if they can. But, uh, as, you know, there's, we're going back to looking at plants. Yeah. Because yeah. The, the synthetics are failing because we've overused them. Yeah. Like when I was growing up, penicillin had just come up, and uh, if anything was wrong, I could have a little cut or just about anything. Uh, oh, is little Blaine allergic to penicillin yet? No, then they, they keep using it because overuse. Right. Just, it didn't, it became ineffective. Right? Yeah. Actually, I know somebody very recently who got, uh, you know, had something, was prescribed antibiotics, ended up getting antibiotic resistant infection. Uh, right. from some bacteria and he's been told like yeah if he's in you know serious trouble he's got to be really careful for the next year uh, at well, least. Well and that's that's why we get these things like COPD because we've overused one method right and if you don't try another method then the person's in trouble yeah where using oils for example I've had some COPD cases that were back in shape in no time and for about twenty dollars yeah, you know. So um, most most of our herbal remedies, most of the most popular ones, are very affordable. Yeah. And the only time things aren't is where the plant doesn't have much. It's either hard to find a plant in the wild, or it doesn't have much to give. Right. So some of the things like rose oil and mm -hmm. Melissa and things like that, you can grow Melissa in your yard, and and if you're feeling sad, you can just go like this and. And you know, kind of rub the leaves a little bit, and you get a cloud yeah. of Melissa, and you, go, hmm. <laughs> and you're just happy. But um, it takes a lot of Melissa to get some pure oil, right? Yeah. So it's expensive. And there's always an alternative too, I find as well. Yeah. 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 And so the more that you know your chemistry, you know what to choose for an alternative, and that's why I promote still learning as much as you can about the chemistry of what you're using, right? So that you. You might have a plant you've used for six other things, but it never occurred to you that it's, that's all because it's just, it's astringent. Right. It was recommended to you for stopping breast milk when you're weaning or, or for hemorrhoids or something, but it's actually good for um, your face too. You can use it as a skin cream, the same product, right? Yeah. But uh, we, we're stuck on whatever the label said it was good for. Right. You know, the label could be this long with all the other things it's good for, but consumers today need to be told exactly what, what they need it for yeah. or they won't buy it. You know? Yeah. So how, how important is, uh, you know, when we talk about this relationship of, uh, with plants and yeah, being, being a gardener, you know, in that sense, like, cause you've always been a great uh, example of that, you know, as much as you're into the wild herbs, uh, you've always had, you know, beautiful gardens and had those plants close to you. Talk to them. Yeah. When I was a little boy, my, my mother used to, I, I found it really odd that she'd be talking to the house plants as she watered them. Right. I thought that was pretty weird. And I thought if I ever heard them talking back that she should go to a hospital or something. <laughs> but uh, that never happened. But consciously or subconsciously, she might have heard them talking back, mm -hmm. saying thank you. And some people are so blind to that. I remember coming home from a 
long weekend or something. I had a roommate at the time. And one of my big houseplants by the door was just laying completely over flat. And, and uh, somebody like you or I would walk in and you'd just hear them crying in the corner and get some water as quick as you could. You know, but some people are blind to that. They've yeah. just never gotten tuned in. For sure. Right? And um, so it's a two-way communication street for sure. And um, I, I just had a flash of that when um, uh, Jennifer, my second wife, uh, had introduced me to a great spot, um, a hillside on a ranch uh, not far from Cochrane, overlooking the Bow River below. And um, um, she'd been given permission to go harvest some wild sage there. And uh, uh, I wanted it to be one of the things in my uh, making stuff course. So I went there with a, a, one of those foldable coolers and put a bag in it and filled the whole thing up. But um, uh, I remember the morning like it was yesterday. She had to go to work that day. She was upstairs finishing up in the bathroom and I said, okay, honey, I'll see you tonight. I got to get going. And she said, don't forget, don't forget to ask. And I said, well, you know what I do. I, I thank the whole valley and everything at the end. You know what I do. She said, no, you have to ask. And I said, I'm not going to ask every plant. And she said, you got to ask every plant. <laughs> and so I got to this hillside and I thought, well, I have to honor my wife because this is her spot. And I felt a little silly. So I stood there for a minute and there was just gobs of, so the whole hillside's covered with Artemisia frigida, right? And uh, I felt a little silly and I was standing there. And, and I probably said out loud, not con subconsciously, psychically, I said, does anybody here want to come back to the city with me and teach white people uh, about medicine, your medicine. And one right in front of me said, oh yeah, I want to go. And then one over there said, oh, can I come too? And all of a sudden, all over the hillside, there's, oh, I want to come, I want to come. And instead of leave, leaving the hill that day feeling guilty that I'd taken all these wild plants, the sage had taught me that I was helping them fulfill their destiny. Wow. They're just going to die on the hillside, but I was picking them for a purpose. Right. Amazing. And they appreciated that. And when I came back the next year to the same spot, it was almost like, hey, Blaine's back, <laughs> you know, and I felt so welcome there. And it was a wonderful place to gather because there'd be hawks screeing in the background and mm. once in a while an eagle would fly by, you know, and uh, I was hearing the rapids in the river below. Total Zen experience for me. Yeah. But um, if I just went in there and plowed through it, if she hadn't have nailed me that morning, I may never have learned that opportunity for plant, what we call plant spirit communication, right? Yeah. Where yeah. they, sometimes they'll even, well, that was a big part of the door opening for me was, um, um, it's a short walk from my brother's cabin to a beach where I would like to swim, and just a short ways through the woods. And there was some clover growing there. It's, it's the place where, um, um, I would meditate with pink lady slipper. There's a lot of them. And eventually they told me it was like every time, as soon as I get up there in June, they're all around and I stop and I lay in the moss and I go, wow, I, what, thank you. You're still here. And oh, you've got lots of grandchildren now too. And I lay there with them. So I was going to be there for the summer solstice and I'd learned a bit about flower essences already. So I was going to make some pink lady slipper flower essence and I had the perfect day. It was dead calm, not a cloud in the sky, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I hope I didn't lose the mother from that uh, in my whole getting out of the house and everybody was taking things. Um, I hope the mother's still around, but because um, the mother's good forever. You know? Right. Um, and uh, when I got back to the city, um, I think it was a class actually, or there might have just been some friends over. And I said, hey, I, I want you all to taste something. I'm just going to put a few drops in your mouth, close your eyes for a minute, and tell me how you feel. What, do you, what sense do you get? And one of them just looked, she opened her eyes and looked at me and said, love. And I said, any more? And another one of them said, unconditional love. Mm. Thank you. Wow. 
that's what it's all about, right? Yeah. So anyway, in that spot where it all started for me was there were some clover growing and one of them was a four leaf clover. And a couple of the clovers kind of said, hey, and, and it's this, when I got back, it was three days till Jennifer's birthday. And um, one, of, one of them was trying to tell me the first time I walked by that, hey, there's a four leaf clover right here that you could tape into Jennifer's birthday card and that would make her smile. And, um, and I, I didn't, couldn't have heard that. And I came back the next day and they were like, hey, stupid. You know, like they were almost at that animated, right? Yeah. And it took the third pass before I stopped and kind of, oh, there's a four leaf clover here. And I could just feel all of the, the plants around me kind of going, duh, you know, <laughs> like, like you finally got it, stupid, yeah. you know, kind of thing. So um, it's amazing how once a door opens like that in your heart and mind, how it can change your whole life and your whole experience with them, mm -hmm. like the plant spirit energy thing. Yeah. And, and now, like if a plant's sick, if I walk into somebody else's home and I, I just, uh, I, you know, I think there's some, can't see them from here, but I got a feeling that bush is covered with spider mites, right. you know, and you just never noticed them before, but it was kind of projecting to me across the room. And, I need help, you know, and it's just a wonderful state of mind Yeah, to have that and to know when to, like I was going back to the one in 20 rule, there might be something I really need this afternoon, but if there's not much around, I'm not going to pick it. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. an etiquette thing. Yeah. You know, find some more, look around, maybe they're over the hill or something, you know? Right. And do you believe that sometimes you don't even need to pick it? You know, like even flower essences is in that direction of, of there's, there's an essence that's being yep. transferred. Yep. You're absolutely right. Just go sit with them for a minute. Right. Um, even with physical wounds, you might actually just go sit with them for a minute and watch a scab form. Right. Wow. It's astounding, but yeah, we, we have to maintain that mutual respect thing. And that's why I always think about them as friends. Like it's impossible for me to even watching a movie could be a Western or something. I'm taking an inventory of all the plants that are in the foreground. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like once you take iridology right. when there's a close up of one of the actors yeah. scared because the, the boogeyman's coming up the hallway and you can see their irises clearly yeah. and, and you're already analyzing them because yeah. you can. You know? For sure. Yeah. It's like, oh, is Jim Brown ever constipated? You know, um, <laughs> and you, you, just, congestion. you just can't escape it. So when I go anywhere, the first thing I'm doing is inventory. And sometimes even just in my own mind, sometimes audibly, I'll say hello. You know, like things like Yarrow. I mean, it's, it's in every ditch. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, if you pull over in, in, on the Trans-Canada Highway from coast to coast, Yarrow will be within 15 feet kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I say, oh, there's Yarrow here. It's okay. If anybody gets hurt, we can just pick some Yarrow. Yeah. Oh, you've got a nosebleed. Just pick one leaf and crush it up and <laughs> up the nostril. And um, So... I think of them as my friends mm -hmm. and at times when I'm on a hike where I shouldn't be picking like in K country or something, it doesn't matter. I can still say hello to my friends yeah. and know that they're there. Yeah. And it was such a nice surprise when I found that a lot of my friends were in France too. Yeah. And what is so I got friends all over the world. Totally. Yeah. And on that note, you said that you haven't traveled, you know, much throughout the world, but you've traveled you know, deeply into the world, even though that might not be countries all across, right? It's, it's the places that you have been. I, I love the term, uh, the, the true definition of, of indigenous means to be of a place, right? Right. Like, I think that's one of the greatest experiences is to actually be of a place, wherever you are, to really fully embrace the depths and get intimate and begin to know. And well, that's why the book that was 45 years overdue is called Child of the Boreal. Right. Because that's where it all started for me, just doing little. Some of them were in the park, um, uh, guided. You, you had a little booklet at the front where you can see the plants or whatever, identify them. Or 
there might even be a little wooden sign beside a wild violet or something like that. You yeah. Know? And wild violets are just so happy, you, you have to smile. We had uh, pansies, which are a violet, they're viola tricolor is their Latin name. And uh, I swear that one night when we were eating out on the, the back porch, and there's window boxes all around the deck rails, and there's some of what was in the salad um, were pansies, and we were eating, and I just, I just felt this, the pansies were all staring at us, you know, <laughs> kind of with this, you bastard, you're eating our cousins, you know. Um, but I, I just felt horrible that I was <laughs> yeah. sitting there eating them in front of them. Right. If I was on the front porch and there's no pansies, I would have enjoyed the salad and did enjoy the salad. But, but it was almost creepy, <laughs> yeah. you know, the way they were watching us eat their cousins. So um, I guess the more you tune into stuff like that, it just gets infectious. Yeah. Yeah. But like I said, I, I laugh when I realize I'm doing it, um, even watching a movie. Right. You know, but if, if we go for a hike somewhere, the first thing I'm doing is taking inventory mm -hmm. and just looking at what, who's around. Yeah. And, yeah. You know. and, and seeing their growth, their progression. Like you said, the generations, like, I hope your grandkids are here, right? With the lady slippers. It's, it's what a different way to be in the world. And yeah. Well, we tend to learn, we recognize the plants first because of their showy flowers. Right. But other than flower essence work, the plants are in their least useful phase, phase there because usually we want leaves or roots or whatever. And when they're in bloom, that's where all their energy is going mm -hmm. because they're reproducing their grandchildren. They're, they want to have sex and have seeds, right? Yeah. So um, their leaves may not be as punchy. could even be something like raspberry leaf tea um, will, will be stronger when they're not blooming yeah. or forming berries or... Um, Domestic raspberries, usually if you have canes, we call them, right? The canes, the root system is perennial, but each cane is a biannual. That's right. So you get a nice big cane that comes up with big leaves on it. There's no berries. Those are the leaves you want to pick, but yeah. not all of them because you'll weaken the roots right. and you might not get fruit next year. So you pick a few here and a few there. And uh, I always remind people to... Uh, animals, even domestic cattle and whatnot, unless you've just got a feeding tr trough over there. Um, but any of the wild animals will kind of walk up to a tree and bite into it and tear a strip of bark off. And they may be walking already while they're chewing that strip. Right. And then they bend down. They're very random mm -hmm. with their grazing. And that's how we have to be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that actually reminds me of... Uh, giraffes in Africa uh, chewing on the acacia tree. The acacia tree will produce compounds that gives a clue, a signal to the giraffe. Okay, time to move on. You've had enough of me. Oh, go sure. To the, go that, to the back next. Back to pheromones. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's neat. They start crying. Yeah. And, uh, or it's, there's studies with uh, our own ungulates here that um, uh, some of the willows and things like that, when, when the animals are chewing on them, it goes downwind a little ways and all of the plants actually change their chemistry so the leaves suddenly turn more bitter right and they'll leave the whole area and go eat some grass over there instead mm. um, they, they they literally catch it on the wind yeah yeah you know, or hear it you know however they're communicating but mostly it's about the um, back to pheromones where they're they're communicating that way yeah Another example, I can't remember where I uh, heard of this, but the idea of, so a, a gorilla will put, or a monkey, you know, some sort of animal like that, will put a leaf in its mouth, just kind of hold it there for a bit, and there's some sort of kind of biological exchange where the plant goes, ah, okay, here's what you need, you know, begins to kind of tweak its chemistry based upon what it's reading from that uh, gorilla's saliva. And oh. then the leaves then become more edible. For the, for the gorilla. Okay. Or medicinal, rather, not animal. I've not heard that, but I accept it instantly. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's all part of biofeedback loops, we yeah. call them, right? Cool. Yeah, reminds me of even uh, the, the Anastasia series, which talks about doing that with seeds before you plant a seed in your garden. Put it in your mouth, and again, takes a reed, and then will grow accordingly based upon what it can give you that you might need. 
in, in nutrients. I've had fun with, um, it's always fun introducing people to new things they just never thought of or never noticed before. But um, for some reason one day I bought a whole pound of marigold seeds and um, I put some in my the little sort of window boxes that are on my deck rails and I put some in a five gallon pail right below them that was full of compost on the deck and um, and I planted some on the ground just a few feet away below the deck and so the way I figure it and the way I call it plant intelligence is the ones that were in the little window boxes the roots go out and and they hit the box and they kind of go well, we live in a really little place. We not we better not get very big or we might dry out and die. So they only get tiny and they might have two little flowers. Mm -hmm. The same seeds just feed away in a five gallon pot, um, get to be a much bigger plant and have 35 blossoms. Right. Um, and then the same seeds in the ground, just a few feet away, turn into virtually a bush and have 150 flowers. Yeah. And it's all the same seed. But the ones in the ground know they can and grow all over the place, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think of that as plant intelligence. Right? Yeah, they, neat. Um, sunflower seeds, I do the same thing when I started from that experience uh, after everything's in the ground with um, a few new annuals added or whatever um, and all the boxes are planted and stuff like that and I took some of the the nice black seed uh, sunflower seeds and the same thing the ones that I put in the little box the planters grew same plant about this big right and their their flower head was no bigger than a daisy but the ones that were in the ground over there got to be nine feet right you know it's the same seed yeah yeah you know and um, so I used to always when everything else was planted I would put a few sunflower seeds in all over the property just to see what happened. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, they, they just know what, what they're good for. And if they're in a little space, they would be too at risk of drought, you know, and, or blowing over in the wind. Yeah. So the big ones in good soil and with the right light, the stock gets about this big so that it's more wind stable. Right. Even the um, when I used to grow uh, um, papyrus in my pond. Yeah, I remember so, that. Yeah. Um, when I grew, it all started with when I first built my pond. We were away for just a week or two and came back and the pond was literally full of algae. Right. And somebody said, well, you, you got to get goldfish or something in there because unless you use chemicals, yeah, the algae will take over. So uh, that's when I started getting goldfish at first. The, the guy at this, he said, have you ever had fish before? And I said, well, we used to have 17 aquariums and raise tropical fish and sell them to the pet store, actually, <laughs> when I was a kid. And he said, okay, okay, you're, you're okay then. But just start with, um, just take, you can get the, we call them feeders because people use little goldfish to, to feed snakes and things. So um, they're just like you get ten of them for nine ninety nine, and then uh, if if they do well for you and you don't have a place to winter them, you can bring them back in the fall, and we'll, we won't pay you, but we'll give you a credit note. And you can come back the next spring and get new goldfish. No way. So um, one died, and uh, that was that. But um, I convinced my wife after the first year that they weren't kittens; we they're fish, and they'll probably be okay in the pond. No, 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 no. They're they're so. We, we had to have an indoor pond. Mm -hmm. So the papyrus that I brought indoors would only get about so tall and whatever. But some of them did get, after a couple of years, up to full height, right up to the ceiling, pretty much. But the stems weren't as thick as they were outside right? because they didn't grow in wind. right? So if I moved, I call them the dumb ones, outside in the spring, more than half of them would break the first day right? because they didn't grow with the stress of having to be stronger for the win. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think, uh, let's see if we can kind of take all our conversation and kind of wrap it up into some, some insight based upon what we've just been talking about. So this well, is the- Well, we've been all over the world here with our talk. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, the, the herbalist journey. We've, we've heard more about your journey um, and, you know, 
kind of grow where you're planted, you know? Like, what are the conditions just like, and I, I think I can kind of pull in some threads Never stop there. learning. Yeah. Never stop studying. You see some new speaker in town, you've got the time to go, go. Mm -hmm. Read another book. Yeah. Get another opinion on things. And uh, um, if I see somebody at a conference that is presenting themselves like they, they can handle anything and know everything, I usually back up screaming. Right. Because nobody bats a hundred. And people like that just freak me out a little bit. So there's always something new to grow, something new that even a, a herb I might find out next week that a herb I've used for my whole life does something that I didn't know it did. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm out of date. I haven't been studying because I just do it my way. Right. And um, try and stay fresh, especially in areas of nutrition. I've had students over the years that have come and see me with health issues. And the only reason they were having health issues was their mother was a nutritionist, even at the hospital, but hadn't read a book for 20 years. Right. You know, and that's why it's so nice with, um, I know when my first wife had uh, surgery for TMJ, I think it's called, and for several years, the, uh, the dentist wanted to dent and the surgeon wanted to surge because that's what their specialties are. So she finally uh, got them to agree to work together. And um, uh, if, we, if either of us started talking about herbs, this one guy would just leave the room. Right. That was his way of dealing with it. But um, uh, when she had her surgery done and we had her face all lathered in arnica, uh, we were in for the first post-op uh, visit and there was almost no bruising. Mm. And the orthodontist was just astonished. And he said, I, I heard something about um, you do classes. Or Could I send one of my best staff to your next course? Uh, he was astonished. Where the other guy, the surgeon, I think it was, he, kept, he just kept looking at his watch and her file and, and his watch and the file, and he'd look at her mouth again. And, um, and, and then he finally said, well, you're still going to have a lot of bruising um, probably tomorrow. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he just refused right. to accept that we had a way to mm -hmm. circumvent the, the bruise process. Just flat out refused. Yeah. And I felt sorry for him. Yeah. You know, so um, we've all got room to grow. Nobody bats a hundred. Um, like I said the other day, we can't be pushy about sharing our knowledge because it'll turn some people off. They have their own belief systems and you got to introduce things gently. Or maybe by the time they've heard the same story from three different people, they might start to accept it, you know, and yeah. come back to you for more information. But um, it's, yeah, just like the owls told me, never stop learning. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I feel a bit washed up. I've been sh sharing that with you because I got so busy doing it one way that I'm, I'm out of date a little bit. And having time now, uh, having sold the business or most of it, um, I'll have time to get up to date again. Mm -hmm. I'll be going online and reading some new books and finding out some, I, I remember, uh, like Arnica was one where we didn't know how it actually works. It just works. So we accepted that and it worked, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, every time I'd be at one of these international conferences and there'd be like a, a university department head from uh, professor so-and-so from Budapest or someplace. And I said, you have Arnica there too? And then he said, oh yeah, Arnica. You have Arnica too? Oh Yo, yes, five species here. Oh, five, yeah. and, and I, I, do you know how it works? Oh, no, nobody know Arnica. <laughs> like, uh, you know, it would, it would always be like that. And, and I think it's actually done, it's happened. Somebody rushed up to me somewhere and said, Blaine, Blaine, they actually figured it out. Because right. somehow, I mean, it, you know what happens. It's um, depending on how good your flavonoids are. If you crush something or bump it hard, uh, capillaries get crushed and red blood cells get out of the pipes mm -hmm. and they drown. You know, they're, they're in your interstitial fluid now and they drown there and that's what a bruise is. Right. So we knew that somehow Arnica couldn't put a band-aid on the capillaries. How was it working? 
And somebody finally figured that out, I think. Cool. And I, I didn't write it down and I forget it, but it just comforts me to know that they finally figured it out. Yeah. yeah. But it didn't bother me to use it not knowing how it worked. Mm -hmm. I just knew that it worked. It yeah. always worked. Yeah. Every time, you know? Yeah. So um, there's never room to, 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 to stop growing yeah. or to quit. We, we, we need to stay fresh and uh, listen to other people who might think. I, I learned a lot, for example, being on the committee. I was one of the originators of the, the first... Um, we had a whole group of practitioners that did classes with the city of Calgary. And we said, hey, you know, we know that we're getting the message out there a little bit, but it seems like the same people come back every time. How do we spread the word more? And so we started talking about having our first conference. And um, the city was a bit nervous at first, but they got behind us just a little bit. And um, I think the first one we had was in a high school gym, and we had about 500 people out, and more than half of them were our regular folks. So we were just, you know, teaching the, how does that go about uh, singing to the choir or something? Right. Um, so um, whoever that was, our contact with the city uh, came in and we were all a bit nervous about her calling this meeting. And she said, okay, you guys worked really hard. And um, the first one we did was in the spring. She said, you worked really hard to get this train on the tracks. You got to do another one real, really quick. How about we do a fall one too? Right. So we got 2,000 people out. Wow. And, and then it grew bigger, and it grew bigger so we couldn't have them at high schools anymore because there wasn't enough room. So we had to go to the stampede grounds. Amazing. And, and eventually, even though I was always emceeing and was president for a while, I just had a sense it was starting to get too commercial. Right. And we started out doing it for education. And that's when I, um, well, basically quit. And... Uh, I don't think it was because I quit, but it sunk for a couple of years. Um, but then they picked up again and it, and it continued to grow. And now there's about 10 people that do them. Right. You know? But um, like one of the guys on the committee wanted us to, we can't give this other guy our contact list. We should sell it to him. Right. And I said, no, no, no. We're about education and getting the word out. So the more people we get the word out, if this guy wants to do one too, let's, let, let him have it. Mm -hmm. You know, because that was our mission. Right. Um, so, um, anyway, something came up after there was a bit of a skirmish in front of somebody's booth, and it almost turned into a fist fight. And we were all there, and everybody was talking about what happened that day. And I looked across the table at one of the women and, and said, Wow, in a hundred years, I wouldn't have thought of what you just said about that about that happening. Right. I, I just never would have seen it that way. So once again, never stop learning. You know, yeah. People's opinions are important. Mm -hmm. So it's, I always like to say, it's really easy to have an opinion, but is it an informed one? Because too often we make the mistake of watching one commercial or reading one book or whatever and think, oh, that's got to be true. Mm -hmm. And then you jump in and now you have an opinion about something. Branch out a bit more with your fact checking before you join the team right like even uh even greenpeace did some hateful things for a while there yeah when we started saving seals they didn't need saving it right. was just that the original harvesting methods were atrocious so they show people pictures of battered seal cubs all over a bloody beach mm -hmm. and oh yeah we got to save them they didn't need saving right you know our indigenous people had been harvesting them for years and they made moccasins and they did all sorts of things and um, they, we ended up killing a lot of seals because we tried to save them because they overpopulated and a couple of viruses got involved to lower the population again right. and we actually almost put them on the extincted list because we were trying to save them <laughs> and pretty movie stars are on tv doing ads and yeah. you know completely completely missed the point so um the more that we learn there's another old saying about the, the more that you know, like if you have three PhDs, you probably finally realize you don't know much about anything. Right. And um, over the years, there's been a few people I've helped. I remember one of them was a, uh, one of Canada's top uh, plastic surgeons. And they had a big, beautiful home out in um, 
uh, art, artist view or whatever it's called on the way to Cochrane there, sort of. Um, anyway, um, he asked me if I could come out. They had a bunch of electrical problems at the house. And if I could, he heard that I was doing renovations and stuff just for myself. And he said, I don't care what you charge me, but almost all of it was changing light bulbs. Right. So you have this highly awarded, wrote two books, right. gets big, big money at national conferences and stuff, but he doesn't know how to change a light bulb. Yeah. Right. And I thought about that. Um, sometimes we, we just get caught up in one way of thinking that, or so much education in one line of thinking that you really don't know much at all. For sure. <clears throat> yeah. So never stop learning. Yeah. And uh, reminds me of just that kind of foundational, timeless wisdom that you've been talking about as well that comes through observation, that comes through relationship. And uh, yeah, there's getting up to date. There's always that part of it, but there is that foundational. We just know it works because we observe it. We experience it. The old ways worked, whether they knew how or not, they just used them. Mm -hmm. they, they took it for granted. Um, it's nice when I'll get news that something we've used for thousands of years actually gets scientifically proven. Right. Um, I remember a fairly large article in the Herald a few years back that science finally discovered how DEET works. And I was like, are you kidding me? You know, <laughs> we've been using DEET for mosquitoes forever, and they finally figured out how it works, you know? <laughs> right. And, and I, I just, when I read the article, I kind of laughed because um, I've always said that most mosquito repellents aren't actually repellents. They're just camouflage. Right. You know, so like some of the oils that we use for bugs, they're not repellents. They just, if you use enough, almost any essential oil will work as an insect repellent because you don't smell like a mammal anymore. You smell like a rosemary bush, you know, <laughs> like, you know, it's just camouflage. They don't smell you. Right. You know? yeah, so, um, and, and I, I swear that you can use almost any oil you want. Yeah. If you use enough, they just won't smell you. <laughs> so they're not going to bite you, right? Yeah. Cool. All yeah. right. Okay. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you again, sir. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. It's been good. Good. Indeed. And I hope everybody out there got something out of all of that spiel. Oh, I'm sure they did. Yeah. Please post your comments down below. Share this with, uh, with some friends, those that are also on the path. Apparently, we're going to keep doing this. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. At least for the month of May, we'll, we'll do a few. And then we got to plan our live event as well. Yes, at some point I'll be um, probably at the store, hey? Yeah. And um, it'll be good to see some of you old friends face to face again. Yeah, right on. Okay, well, until then, till next time. Adios. Adios. Ciao for now. <laughs>